So we are very honored to have uh, with us today uh, Dr. Dario Pompili, um, and uh, he will talk uh, about uh, reliable underwater acoustic video transmission towards a human-robot dynamic interaction. But uh, before starting, I would like uh, to give you some notes about his bio. So uh, Dario is Associate Professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, where he is uh, the director of the Cyber Physical System Laboratory, which focuses on mobile computing, wireless communication networking, underwater acoustic communications, and sensor networks uh, IoT. He received a PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology with uh, Professor Aki Irditz. And uh, he previously received uh, a, a doctorate degree in telecommunication and system engineering from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Uh, in 2011, uh, Dario received the, the uh, NSF Career Award to design efficient communication solution for underwater multimedia applications. He received an impressive number of awards, but I think he deserves um, to be said that it was the top cited author for underwater acoustic sensor network research challenges in ad hoc networks in 2005, and then again the most cited ad hoc network author for a three dimensional and two dimensional deployment analysis for underwater acoustic sensor network, again in ad hoc networks. He won also the best demo award with uh, towards a reconfigura reconfigurable cyber physical system. He published more than 150 uh, publications with more than 13,000 uh, citations. He's fellow with IEEE and a distinguished member of ACM. He's currently also serving as associate editor in IEEE transaction on mobile computing and is an area chair for IEEE Infocom. So thank you again, Dario. Uh, you can start, and also Dario told me before that he's available to receive questions also during the talk, so I suggest that you can write your question in the Q&A panel, and then, uh, okay, he's available to reply either during or at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Giulia. Thank you, Enrico, for, uh, Enrico for inviting me, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, distinguished seminar, seminar uh, organized by the Technology Innovation Institute. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Dario Pompili. I'm from, I'm the director of the Cyber Physical Systems uh, Laboratory, CPS Lab, uh, with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, in, uh, at Rutgers, uh, Rutgers University in, uh, we are based in New Jersey, uh, United States. So this, this talk is about reliable underwater acoustic video transmission towards um, uh, human uh, robot dynamic interactions. This is a topic I started working on uh, underwater uh, communications and uh, in general, the, the, the use of underwater communication for um, uh, underwater robotics when I did my uh, PhD at uh, Georgia Tech uh, with Professor Akilditz. Um, but um, so today we, we will focus mostly on the latest, uh, latest technology to uh, enable reliable, persistent sensing and multimedia. So um, yeah, before starting, let me give you a little bit of, in, of, of, uh, of, of, of background on where we are in, in terms of acoustic communication. So in the past um, uh, decade, uh, underwater communications have enabled a wide range of applications. Um, the, um, uh, a wide range of applications. Uh, however, there are novel applications and systems such as coastal uh, multimedia surveillance, oil pipe bridge inspection, water quality, marine pollution monitoring, video monitoring of geological, biological processes from seafloor to uh, air sea interface, and underwater internal things that require near real time multimedia acquisition, classification, and transmission. So wireless acoustics is the typical physical layer communication technology for underwater data transmission for distances above 100 meters. Uh, transmitting videos wirelessly underwater using acoustic waves, however, is a very challenging task as the underwater acoustic channel suffers from time varying attenuation and fading, limited bandwidth, Doppler spreading, high propagation delay, and high bit error rate. 
So for all these reasons, state-of-the-art acoustic communication solutions are still mostly focusing on enabling um, delay tolerant, uh, low bandwidth, low data rate, scalar data transmission, or at best, low quality, low resolution multimedia streaming in the order of few tens of, of kilobit per second. On the other hand, as we know, so while conventional underwater acoustic modems with their fixed hardware designs hardly meet the high data rate and flexibility needed to support video requirements for futuristic multimedia and underwater uh, internet things driven applications, novel algorithms and protocols can be implemented on reconfigurable software defined architectures so as to perform in network analysis and or to transmit a high volume of data to a remote node depending on the environment and system specifications. The outline of this talk is as follows. So I'll, um, there will be a, an introduction and motivation for, for the need of persistent and reliable underwater uh, co communications, especially this, this talk will focus on acoustic communications that, um, uh, that, that is the technology when the range is, is above 100 meters, right? Uh, and then I will focus on, on three main pieces of work, and then I will give references to, to, to our recent papers for further details. Uh, the first one is we'll focus on reliable and persistent data transmission in underwater internal things, mostly to uh, transmit scalar data. Okay? The second uh, piece of work that I will talk about in this talk is uh, fo we'll focus on uh, SVC, so scalable video coding transmission for in network underwater Im imagery analysis. The third will focus on underwater adaptive video transmission using, uh, using MIMO based software defined acoustic models. And then I will conclude uh, the talk and, um, and, 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 uh, and, and, and talk a, a little bit about what we are currently doing and what I see. The, uh, the research community in working on the water communication uh, is, is currently working on and should work on. Um, so as we know, um, so the, the ocean is the most unexplored uh, environment in, in, in our earth, right? So 70, 70% 70 of, the, of, the, of our earth is covered by water and still uh, we know little about, about our underwater uh, uh, world. Uh, mostly because it's very challenging to, to monitor it, right? Uh, but it's becoming more and more important to, to monitor it and, uh, and animals and plants un underwater. Um, uh, uh, there are many uh, appli uh, applications uh, that we can think of that would require uh, uh, underwater communications uh, uh, reliable and, and persistent so with the use of the video transmissions for a variety of, of, of services, right? Um, um, like streaming services, we can think of in general oceanographic data gathering. Uh, pollution monitoring is, is, is becoming very important. Um, uh, noise monitoring, it, it, it's also uh, an application that is, 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 uh, is gaining traction. Uh, lately uh, because of its impact to human and animal lives. Disaster preventions and uh, the possibility of using acoustic systems to, um, um, uh, to uh, not predict, really, but to, to, for early detection of, of sea quakes and, uh, and, 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 and tsunami and to give, uh, we're talking about few minutes of warning to, to people when a tsunami is, appro is approaching. Um, and many others. So what will the world look like in the future? Uh, we don't know, but, but uh, we know that uh, the, the, the level of, 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 the, of seas are, are, uh, are rising. And so we need to be prepared. Uh, and, uh, and we know that uh, uh, we are, plastic is, is a problem, uh, microplastics. Now we even talk about na nanoplastics uh, that, uh, that is, is becoming more and more per pervasive in the water that we that we all uh, drink and, and use. Here are some, are some recent examples of, on the left, um, animals and, and whales that uh, have um, been, uh, that have eaten a great amount of, of, of 
plastic and, and leather and, uh, and, and the beach and uh, sometimes the, the, the beach because they are confused uh, uh, because of the of, 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 uh, of noise and other times we have uh, islands of, of waste of, of plastic uh, that is uh, polluting and uh, our environment. Um, so we need to uh, achieve um, uh, real time or near real time that, that depends on the definition of, of real time. Real time um, in, in the water environment doesn't, doesn't have to be seconds or milliseconds. It could also be uh, hours, right? Or uh, if it's compared to uh, how uh, things are done now in terms of water quality monitoring, which is um, taking samples and having a lab uh, to, uh, to analyze uh, this, this requires days, right? So depending on the application definition of time, uh, real time is, is somewhat flexible, right? Uh, other applications as always is multimedia coastal and tactical surveillance for a variety of, of, of aims, under undersea offshore exploration, detecting and classify plumes, um, oil pipe bridge inspection, this is, um, uh, for example, I, I can give you the example in New Jersey, we have many, we have thousands of bridges. We don't have the, the large and, and, and bridges uh, that uh, New York and, and California have, but we have thousands of small, medium-sized bridges all requiring in continuous inspections, which is an application that is very expensive, sending a crew inspecting bridges and the pipes um, and the pillars right, um, um, su supporting these bridges, right? So this is something that should be automated using robots or a team of, team of semi-autonomous robots. And I will talk more about this. Or monitoring of geological and biological processes is very important. And in general, on the water internal things where we have many uh, devices, sensing de devices that, that can uh, track phenomena in time, in time and, and space. So in all these applications, or in many of these applications, multi, the, the ability and the, the possibility to transmit multimedia data, so not just beyond, going beyond scalar data, is, is, uh, is often required or in any way desirable uh, for, especially for the mission critical applications, right? Um, uh, sending a, a, a robot, um, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's not yet imaginable that a team of robots can fully autonomously complete the mission. Rather, it's more realistic assuming that there, is, uh, there are humans on, on, on the coast, uh, on, in, on land uh, that are ex with expertise, for example, about the bridge inspection that need to uh, look at what these robots are uh, recording. Uh, at the same time, these robots, and this is uh, the, one of the, of, of the goals of, my, of our uh, research in my lab is to make these robots uh, aut autonomous or have some degrees of semi-autonomy in how they can coordinate on the water to capture videos and, and streaming uh, on, on land. So we, we don't want these robots to be uh, remotely operated by, by humans because that will not scale and also um, it would, it would, uh, yeah, it would not scale when, when the number of of, uh, of of vehicles increases, right? And uh, so, multimedia applications require high data rate for video transmission. Um, and, and when I say high data rate, uh, I mean it's uh, in the past decade or two decades, and the water communications have been restricted to tens of kilobits, right? Whereas now, when we talk about multimedia, we at least need one order or two orders of magnitude uh, uh, higher in terms of data rate. So we are talking about going from tens of kilobits to hundreds and thousands of kilobits at, at least for multimedia. And then uh, in order for multimedia applications to, to, be, um, uh, to, to, to be enabled, we need a certain level of quality of service and quality of experience maintained uh, uh, as the underwater channel changes in, in, in time, in time and space. Um, so, uh, you, human robot dynamic interactions uh, require real time uh, or near real time multimedia acquisitions and, and classifications. Um, remote operated vehicles or vehicles with some, some level of autonomy are key instruments 
to support such interactive applications because they can capture multimedia data from places where humans either cannot easily go or, or safely go or in any way can, cannot go at, um, at with, with, uh, without having pro prohibitive uh, costs, right? So in this um, uh, scenario that we are uh, working on, uh, funded by the US National Science Foundation with our um, NETS uh, project, uh, we uh, use a variety, so a, a, a variety of robots. So here we see a blue rod that is a remote operated vehicle. Uh, when you, uh, it's a, so it's, it's a vehicle that it comes with a pad and a remote, and a, and a remote uh, that we have in our lab uh, enhanced with the same autonomous capabilities, right? And, um, and then you see another vehicle, an aviator. This is uh, um, here, um, it's a multi-medium drone that is able to fly. And, and this is a great advantage with respect to the uh, underwater uh, robots uh, because of the ability to move fast, right? From, from one position to another position, plus to have a larger field of view from, from, the, air, from the sky, from the air, right? But it's also a drone that is able to well, not only go in the water because any drone can go in the water, right? But this this navigator can, in fact, then resurface, right? Because it's it's a it's a, it's a robot uh, um, designer ruggers to be able to transition from air to water and and back, right? And um, so this project looks at the interactions and the coordination between uh, different types of of vehicles uh, for the inspection of 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 pillars of, of bridges, right? In this application, we can imagine two scenarios, right? So scenario one, we have, we do data fusion at the buoy. This is a buoy that is basically collecting the, the raw data and, 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 and videos from the different robots. And then some fusion, fusion happens at, at the buoy, right? The second scenario, uh, we do in-network data fusion at the robots, of course, uh, there are pros and cons in, in, in these scenarios. If the bandwidth is, 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 uh, is limited, in-network in data fusion would allow to, to do some, some processing locally and then transmit um, at the buoy uh, information uh, and that is more refined, right? So not the raw data, but through semantics and, and, and data fusion, some, some information. And, and possibly by running some models, if possible in the network, even going from information to, to knowledge that is always needed when you want to close the loop, for example, right? And, and uh, allow the team of robots to, um, to decide on next steps. Um, so near real time water quality monitoring of physical uh, variables is, is another project that we are working on. This is funded by the NSF Cyber Physical Assistance Projects and, 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 and Rutgers. We want to, uh, as I mentioned, transform data from raw data to information to knowledge uh, and, and be able to close the loop in order for the robots and uh, for, the, for the robotic platforms to take optimal decisions uh, in network. So for in this project, uh, we define a three, a, a three layer cyber physical system. Cyber physical systems are systems that have uh, as the word says, right? A physical part and a cyber part, right? So the physical part has to do with robots, anything that we can touch, right? So robots uh, and, and, and the, their, with their sensing capabilities and the data coming from, from the environment, right? So the, all the measurements uh, of the different manifestations of a, of, of a phenomenon, right? And then we have a cyber part in these CPS systems that includes the models and the software that is running, right? to transform uh, data um, possibly on board in any way in network, right? So in, uh, we define a, a three layer CPS. Here in the figure, we see the three layers. So the first layer, layer one, uh, is composed of these uh, uh, navigators, uh, which are the, the multi-medium hybrid drones that I talked uh, just earlier. These multi-medium drones have a narrow spectrum sensing, but fast moving, fast moving capabilities, right? Fast moving capabilities because of drones, they have cameras and they can detect, for example, patches of, of plastics or, of, or, or different regions of interest, right? Here we, we see the pictures. 
So the second layer on top is composed of autonomous surface underwater robots with narrow spectrum senses, but with high temporal and spatial resolution capabilities because these robots are in the water and they can go towards the different regions of interest as instructed by the navigators and, um, and, uh, and, um, and, and do adaptive sampling within these regions of interest. The navigators are not simply drones, as, as we said, they can also um, uh, in, in doubt go in the water like cormorant, like those birds that dive in the water to, for hunting, this, 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 uh, the navigators can go in the water, take samples and refine their definitions of, of, of these regions of interest for layer two uh, robots, uh, underwater robots, and, th and these blue robots are just an example. This could be, um, these are robots that we are using in my lab, but it could be any underwater robots with uh, a, 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 some level of autonomy, right? And, uh, and then we have a layer three on top, uh, lab on board. This is, uh, we have a few lab on boards uh, with broad and accurate spectrum sensing capabilities, but slow moving and low spatial and temporal sensing resolution. So these are pretty like boats where uh, researchers and Rutgers also students for educational purposes can do uh, water quality monitoring and, 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 and sampling uh, of, 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 of the data. And, and of course the measurements are very uh, accurate, uh, but of course they, they take longer, right? So, so the idea is to be uh, fast with with uh, with identification of the regions layer one, and then do some preliminary measurements with the with the robots uh, layer two, and then do uh, maybe take some samples uh, and and send and and send these samples to the boat at layer three, or or have the boat move if the region is large enough and it's worth moving the boat. Uh, this is a video, I hope you see, this is a video that we collected from the river, from the Raritan River here in New Jersey. And this, this project is, is, uh, is focusing on, 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 the, on, the, on, on, on water quality monitoring in rivers, but this extends to uh, monitoring uh, water quality in water reservoirs, uh, very important in more in general, in any body of waters, lakes, and of course also the ocean scaling uh, the, the, uh, appropriately the number of robots and the type of robots. Uh, this is our uh, blue rov that is performing some adaptive uh, sampling in one of the uh, one of the canals, one of the creeks uh, in here in, in New Jersey. And this is uh, the blue rov um, indoor. Uh, this is for. Uh, uh, they, 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 we are testing and debugging some algorithms for them to form a formation and then uh, maintain the formation and they, as they move and do adaptive sampling. Adaptive sampling is very important because we never have all the devices, all the robots that we would need uh, to, 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 to scan and, and, and use a brute force approach in scanning a certain body of water. The water is, is huge, whatever bodies you, you focus on, you, you will always find yourself limited in terms of, of, of resources, right? So it's very important to, to use, uh, as in any cyber-physical systems, models to um, predict uh, different manifestations of, of a phenomenon. Uh, and, and, and then using the data that you have, data that you have collected online, but also data that you have offline, right? And, and the importance of adaptive sampling in, 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 uh, is that uh, you're not, again, sending these vehicles everywhere, but you are selectively sending or they are deciding where to go based on the level of uncertainty of, of these models. The higher the uncertainty of a model, the, 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 more, like, the more likely and the, the higher the reward in, in, in the context of reinforcement learning and every, uh, the higher the reward for robots to go in, in those regions, right? Where models don't work well, right? Um, this is an idea. So, uh, in terms of, uh, of objectives of, of this research, so we uh, work to perform in situ transformation of the measurements of raw data into valuable information and then into knowledge through collaborative information fusion and integration, uh, solve the problem of uncertainties that arise in, in situ processing of data in any cyber physical systems. We are talking about uncertainties in the data. So the one problem that we focus on is 
the, the finding the right trade-off between quantity of the data and quality of the data that is uh, is being sensed by the by the uh, the team of robots, uncertainties in in the resources and uh, that you have the computing resources that you have, and um, um, and uh, and uh, and the uncertainties in uh, in the models, right? The models come with their own uncertainties, and I was mentioning that in terms of level of accuracy. Um, uh, the other objective is to, pro is to provide greater autonomy, robustness, and cooperation in cyber-physical systems while improving on their scalability, reliability, and timeliness in, compares in comparison to traditional uh, sensing systems. Design novel communication solutions for robust, reliable, and high data rate on the water multimedia streaming. As I mentioned, we want to go from uh, 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 tens of kilobits to hundreds and thousands of kilobits per second. At, uh, depending on the application for our applications and, and, and lake and rivers, we talk about hundreds of meters. Of course, for oceans, we need we need um, one, two, three orders of magnitude high. Uh, and then integrate various communication algorithms and methods on a software defined testbed using conventional hydrophones and acoustic vector sensors, AVS, in order to support processing intensive physical layer software defined functionalities. And be, uh, uh, and be in real time reconfigurable based on user's quality of experience. I will tell you more about, about this in, in the last part of the talk. So specifically uh, the contributions in our, uh, uh, from, from our lab in the past, uh, in, in, in the recent years uh, that are focused on in this talk uh, involved a novel physical aid communication solutions for robust, reliable and high data rate and the world and multimedia transmission um, a novel medium access control uh, protocol based on a probabilistic space division multiple access SDMA in sparse underwater networks and uh, pretty much any underwater network is sparse because as I said, the, the, the environment is always much larger than the number then of, of vehicles that, that we have, right? And in network collaboration for CDMA based reliable underwater acoustic communications, we propose an adaptive hybrid automatic repeat request and a novel correlation-based uh, HRQ for reliable and persistent water quality monitoring and the water internal things, and a scalable video coding-based transmission for in-network ima imagery analysis. This is important because, because the, 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 the quality uh, of, of the channel, right? So the, 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 the water channel state is fluctuating a, a, a lot in, in time. So we need to adapt when we transmit uh, multimedia data uh, so that we can we can basically transmit a low, lower resolutions and there are many knobs that we can play with in uh, using scalable video coding when the channel is uh, is, is is not in, in, a, in a good state and uh, and but but without compromising the, the quality of, of of service and the quality of experience of users and finally the adaptive uh, underwater adaptive video transmission using MIMO based software defined acoustic models so. Uh, let me let me start with the uh, uh, with the with the first work and and uh, for all these works I'll give references to our papers at the bottom of the slides you'll see this is a paper with my students uh, SSFB is a signal space frequency beforming for underwater acoustic video transmission um, so the main idea of this work is to is to be able to um, um, collect. A multimedia information from 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 robots, right? So the idea here is that, is that we have a buoy, and we need to increase and go, and go from tens to hundreds and thousands of kilobit per second. Uh, so how how do we do that in an environment that is so challenged? So we propose a signal space frequency beam forming. So there is there is beam forming uh, that we, we work on. So here we use acoustic vector sensors. Acoustic vector sensors are transducers that don't measure only the pressure of, 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 the, uh, of the acoustic wave, the acoustic, acoustic wave is uh, uh, are, are mechanical waves, right? So traditional transducers just give an information about the, the pressure, it's a scalar information, right? But acoustic vector sensors are also able to give you information about the, 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 the angle of arrival, the, the direction of the acoustic wave, which is very important because it would increase tremendously the, 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 the the accuracy of angle of arrivals, especially when you use arrays of acoustic vector sensors. Um, so the vehicle travels at a fairly constant speed to capture a video and, and, and uh, of their environment. And the buoy tries to 
track it uh, as it moves. Um, so one thing to consider is that in all our works, we have a, a, a factor in the fact that we know that the, the, lo the location of the, uh, of the vehicle is not accurate, right? And I, I'll tell you more about this, uh, this concept, right? So we have uncertainty in the position. We have, a, a, uh, there is some uncertainty in the position that is here in the figure uh, um, depicted as a, as, a as, as a cylindrical region of, un of, of uncertainty. Of course, the vehicle will be in a specific position, right? But the vehicle itself doesn't know, and even more, the other nodes and the Boeing included and the other vehicles, they don't know where it is. It might be in a certain region. And um, previous approaches have overlooked at these aspects and have just considered that uh, the vehicle is in a specific position. But if, if it's not in a specific position, if it's an, in a, it could be in a, in a region, that's something that you want to know when you develop pretty much any protocol from the, at the physical layer, MAC layer, routing layer. Um, um, you, you can imagine, for, for example, for simplicity, right? So just for the sake of power control, when you need to transmit, decide how much power to transmit to reach a certain vehicle, one thing if, is if the cylinder is small, meaning that the uncertainty is small, and in that case, you can tune and, and, and optimize the power, transmit power much better than if the uncertainty is large. And this is, uh, this is important because you need to then decide uh, beams, so the angles, the, the directivity, the, the, the power, and, and for, for anything, right? Even to, to decide who to transmit data to, right? So yeah, the certain region should be should be considered. Uh, this is this is the the, the, the paper single space frequency beam forming for underwood acoustic video transmission that you can look at, right? So here I, I will just give some high level uh, descriptions of the of the signaling block diagram for this uh, uh, uncertainty position uncertainty aware uh, beam forming based um, physical layer solution. So we have a video encoding. Uh, so on the left, we have the A is, is the vehicle. And on the, on the right, we have, we have the buoy. So here uh, for this application, we are, uh, the buoy is giving some feedback to the, to the vehicle based on the quality of the reconstructed video, the buoy. And is the vehicle that is moving uh, and, and, uh, and, and taking videos from the environment and transmitting the data to the buoy, right? So the vehicle does video encoding, for example, using scalable video coding, which I will talk more later. Uh, SVC, which is an extension of H.264 uh, video compression standard that allows you to have to have a lot of degrees of freedom in, in how you can play with the video and, and, and downgrade the quality of the video when needed. When needed is when the channel is not in good condition, right? Um, uh, space signal designation um, is the other block functions that we have de developed a non-contiguous OFDM for multimedia transmissions. Uh, we, we then do beam forming, which basically involves selecting the width of the beam and the, di the direction of the transmission, right? And this is done uh, the, uh, thanks to some tracking that at the buoy happens. Uh, and uh, so this, here there are basically two beams, right? One is the beam that is used to, by, the, by the vehicle to transmit, and one is the beam uh, uh, optimized at the buoy uh, uh, as it tracks the, the vehicle moving, right? At the receiver side, we do angle of arrival estimation um, and acoustic vector sensors help greatly in, in, in increasing the, uh, this, this angle of arrival estimation um, uh, ac accuracy. Um, then we do antenna decision. Uh, we add then the, counter, the NC or FDM receiver counterpart, uh, the, the data subcarrier sub extraction, detection and, and demodulation. So um, what is interesting and, 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 and is that because the, the quality of the channel changes in, in time and, and space, there is a need to do some fine tuning. And we do that uh, thanks to a feedback that is sent back from the, from the, from the buoy to the vehicle that is transmitting. So uh, the, the space uh, signal designation and video scalability in time, space and quality are adjusted based on user quality of experience. 
So in time, because we, we can play with the frame rate of, of videos, right? We can increase or decrease the frame rate of the video. The, the space, because we can play with the size of the, of the frames, uh, and we will show examples uh, later. And then quality, because we can play with the signal to noise ratio and, and uh, per pixel. Right? So there is a need to adapt. This is the, 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 the takeaway point uh, to the acoustic channel conditions, uh, which requires software defined and entirely uh, reconfig reconfigurable capabilities in, in, in the scheme. Um, in the next work, I want to talk about how do we transition from one to multiple vehicles. It's uh, in many applications, one vehicle alone is not sufficient. Um, uh, you, you need to transition from one to multiple vehicles for, for, a, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you want to achieve effective coordination of a team of autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, and, and that uh, is because, for example, you want to do 3D reconstruction of a video, or you want to, ex to explore a larger area. Or for a uh, or for a variety of reasons, right? And and this um, requires a, a having a medium access control that is fair and is efficient, right? Fair because of course you you want all the nodes to be able to transmit when they have data, and efficient because the the, the, the bandwidth is is very limited, you know? and uh, so we need a, a Mac that is that is efficient and that uh, that uses well the limited resources available. So this Mac should be designed and tailored to the underwater acoustic environment. So one a uh, promising yet unexplored MAC technique for sparse underwater network is space division multiple access as DMA. And this is what we have proposed in this, in this paper uh, that is, was published in, in mass in 2015 and then came out uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in transaction mobile computing uh, last year. Uh, this solution explores the signal beam directivity and the spatial separation of the vehicles. It makes use of the fact that vehicles uh, uh, can be served simultaneously when they are not located in the same area, so that the radiated energy for each user can be separated in, in space. And again, we can do that because we, we are dealing with a, a sparse uh, network. Um, and and uh, so we have proposed a probabilistic MAC solution based on, on SD, SDMA. And differently from conventional terrestri terrestrial SDMA approaches, uh, we take into account the, the position uncertainty. So it will be clear now uh, what, what we mean by that. So in terms of position uncertainties, in general, we have two different types. Um, so we, we define internal and external position uncertainty. The internal position uncertainty is the position uncertainty associated with the vehicle. So the vehicle does some localizations, right? There are many localization techniques, but any localization technique uh, using other anchor nodes or triangulations doesn't give the vehicle the, space, the, the, the super accurate position. Uh, there is some uncertainty associated with uh, geolocalization because G GPS doesn't work. So you need to underwater, you need to use other techniques. There are techniques, but all these techniques uh, give the vehicle, uh, vehicle J, for example, an, an uncertainty. This we call um, uh, internal position uncertainty is the uncertainty seen by the vehicle itself, okay? And then we have another form of uncertainty, which is the external uncertainty. This is the uncertainty seen by others, um, uh, seen by others. Now, uh, there is a difference and, and the, 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 the difference uh, is, is mainly because it depends on how you, you localize yourself underwater, if you're a vehicle and how other vehicles or the buoy uh, uh, localize you, okay? In general, um, uh, the, ex the external position uncertainty is larger than internal position uncertainty, but not always, because if you use some cooperation techniques, the external position uncertainty can be lower than the internal position uncertainty. But the point is that there is an uncertainty associated to the position, which means that basically you don't know where the vehicle is. The vehicle could be uh, anywhere in a certain re region with a certain distribution, with a certain probability, okay? Uh, here, for example, we see the buoy that needs to transmit to these vehicles. So here we have vehicle J and vehicle I, and uh, these vehicles have their own uncertainty, right? That the, 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 the shape of the region depends on many different things. It depends on what you know about ocean uh, or currents and, um, and, uh, and, and what type uh, of um, localization vehicles use, right? So position certainty of a vehicle can be 
shown using a cylinder. This is what, what we have done. And, and, uh, and basically the problem here is if I want to, in a, in a medium access control, if I, the question is, can I separate spatially these two vehicles, J and I, so that the buoy can transmit uh, different data, data that is meant for vehicle J and, and data that is meant uh, for vehicle I simultaneously without too much inter interference, then, then is, is the answer is yes. The question is, okay, what, what should be the beam with uh, uh, the buoy and the direction of, of the beam? So it, it, this paper, it, it, it's, it's about opti optimizing angles and transmissions um, and considering different trade-offs, right? So, um, uh, so this slide shows what I mean by, by trade-offs, right? Because here we have uh, the case in which um, gli uh, gli gliders of vehicles or gliders are, are propellerless autonomous vehicles, right? They, they, they just change their buoyancy and, they, and by changing their buoyancy, they follow a certain trajectory. They can go up and down in the, in the water and they're very energy efficient and, uh, and, and they, they can be kind of engaged in missions for, for weeks as opposed, but, but of, of course they move slowly, right? They have fractions of meters per second, the, the horizontal velocity. But anyway, so in this slide, we show that these two vehicles are not perfectly se se separable and there is some statistical interference, right? There's a statistical interference here, here right? Based on the PDFs, of, of, of the, the probabilities of, of, of where these two gliders are, right? So overlapping the uncertainty regions lead in general to a statistical acoustic interference that needs to be minimized in, a, in, 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 in a SDMA, in our probabilistic SDMA. So the solution of a transition problem determines the optimal values of angles. Uh, so when we talk about angles, we talk about the beam width and the beam directivity. For minimum probability of interference, at a tolerable miss, miss rate. Um, so that's why I talk about a trade-off, right? There's a trade-off between target interference and miss, right? So uh, if the width, for example, right? And uh, uh, here we, we see the, the vertical view of the system uh, representing gliders J and I that overlap statistically, right? Because they, they are um, kind of um, not, not too far apart. Right? which is the case, for example, if, if they do the same mission, right? And if they're cooperating. So now what is this? Let me, let me clarify the trade-offs, right? So smaller beam uh, results in a better directivity and therefore a signal to noise ratio, but it increases the probability of missing the vehicle. By missing the vehicle, I mean, not transmitting to the vehicle to, towards the direction of the vehicle enough power so that uh, the SNR is above some, some, some thresholds. Uh, on the other hand, wider beam might lead to interference to other vehicles, right? Um, and which, which we don't want, right? So there is a need to, to estimate these this, uh, this uncertainties and, and take care of this. Um, um, now, let me, let me talk about, so, so far we have talked about uh, tracking and, 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 and vehicles and creating beams and optimizing the, the transmission system in terms of power and beams, right? But the other problem that I, I mentioned is, is reliability. So the underwater channel is, is in general very unreliable. And for some applications, we want to be sure that our data is indeed, uh, re, has indeed reached the destination, right? Um, so LQ is a conventional error control transmission technique that uses acknowledgement messages, right? Uh, we need to reduce the number of packet retransmissions as, uh, as much as possible. Uh, so as to increase the overall system uh, reliability. This is especially important on the water because the bandwidth is, is limited, right? So transmitting is a very inefficient way uh, of, of achieving reliability. Uh, here we are talking about link reliability, right? So link reliability. Uh, of course, you can always have end-to-end -end reliability using some transport layer solutions, but underwater when the link reliability is very low, has been shown that it's you, you, you want link reliability, right? So if, if there is any problem locally, you want to solve the problems locally. You don't want to, to re retransmit at, 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 the, at, at layer four, right? And when to, you want to take care of things at, uh, where the problems arise uh, to be faster in, 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 in reacting to the problem and also to use better the, 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 the limited resources. 
Uh, HRQ is uh, when ARQ is combined with forward error correction, uh, FEC, to reduce the number of transmissions. ARQ, we have in general two types. We have type one, every retransmitted packet conveys the same information. Uh, so the error detection and FEC. This, more, uh, this method is called chase combining. ARQ type two, which is more efficient, exploits incremental redundancy, IR, IR, and retransmits extra information as a complement to the data containing previous packets. Uh, a ARQ was proposed for the, for the underwater environment and can improve the packet rate in underwater acoustic networks. Uh, using uh, and, and what we have proposed is to, in, in the context of MIMO, to extend arbitrary IRQ so that the retransmission uh, is the retransmissions are minimized. So uh, using a large number of antenna in a multiple input, multiple output configuration, where we have multiple transmitting elements at the at the transmitting buoys. Here we have the transmitting buoy with the with the pole and multiple transmitting elements, right? Uh, underwater. And, and, and possibly we also have multiple receiving elements at the AOVs. The acoustic vector sensors are pretty small. We have put them in, in, in many different uh, arrays, um, co configurations, right? So you can think of linear or better circular arrays configurations. Um, and using combining IRQ with MIMO brings forward opportunities for incre increased system reliability and spectral efficiency. So on the left here, we have the conventional IRQ type two, uh, where for example, here we see that six packets are transmitted and we send uh, acts for, for packet one and packet two, but then uh, if, if there is an error for packet three at the receiver, then a NAC is, is sent, which involves the need for retransmission of the FEC associated with packet uh, three, right? So you don't transmit the entire packet, you transmit the FEC, the forward cor correction uh, control information associated with packet three. Same happens with six, and an FEC of six is transmitted, uh, re, uh, right? And, and then at the receiver with the information of packet three, right? We have errors, but we, we store that, that packet, right? That data. And on top of that FEC, the new FEC, combining FEC with the original packet should allow the receiver to correct the errors of packet three, otherwise a new FEC needs to be requested, right? But here we see this is the conventional IBRQ uh, type two. On the right, there is our solution that is MIMO-based to reduce the probability of retransmission. For example, here we see, and the idea is that because we have multiple transmitting elements and multiple receiving elements, there is more diversity, we have more links. Um, and so the probability that some links are in good state uh, is, is obviously higher. So we use MIMO not to go faster, but for reliability here, right? Um, so here, for example, specifically, you see that Six is still problematic, right? Because six, a packet six requires, uh, we send a NAC, right? And be because all these packet six are corrupted, right? So we need a new new information associated with, pack, uh, with packet six. But for example, for packet three, um, uh, you see that some of these packets are corrupted, but there is one, uh, thanks to, to, to MIMO, that is received, which uh, uh, allows the receiver to decode Three without the need for retransmission. For retransmission, so more details can be seen in this in this Fubnet paper, um, uh, which was the best paper runner up uh, at at Fubnet in 2015. Um, and this is MIMO, which is great when you can the, put multiple transmitting elements or receiving elements at the buoys or at, at, at the at, at the vehicles. Uh, but in in the context of underwater internal things uh, and pervasive and persistent sensing uh, uh, when, when you need to have a high density of, of sensors deployed, then we need to go back to a single antenna structure, right? And so the, this, this, this MIMO approach cannot be used. So now the question is, okay, for futuristic underwater networks, how do we provide reliability? Um, um, so, um, and, and to do that, when MIMO is, is, not, is not an option for cost and space, uh, we propose an implicit collaborative scheme in combination with a secure and distributed CDMA approach. On the left, we see um, the, the, tradi the traditional approach in, involving retransmissions. So basically, we have transmitter one and transmitter two, transmitter two sends uh, a X2, and, and the receiver sends the ACK, and X1 is. Um, is not 
cannot be correctly decoded at the receiver, so the receiver will send an act, right? Um, based on, 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 on retransmissions. Can we do better than that? Uh, we can by leveraging overheating. So for example, T1, and this is on the right, our solution. Um, X1 is, is assumed uh, to, to be corrupted because of the channel. So the channel from T1 to the receiver is in a bad state. So the receiver R is not able to correctly decode the, the, the data, data X1 from T1, but T3 is overheating. So got this packet from T1 and it's possible that, uh, sorry, not T3, T2, but also T3, but in this example is T2, it's overheating T1, the transmission T2. When T2 transmits X2, um, and it, it, it knows that a receiver R is a sent an, a NAC, we don't need T1 to retransmit because if the, uh, it all depends on the coherence time of the channel. It's possible that the coherence time is larger than the, the timeout and the, and, and the, and, and, and so the, the, for T1, right? So it's possible that if T1 retransmitted uh, the FEC associated with X1, it's possible that the channel would, its own channel from one to R would be still in a, in a bad state. But it's possible that other nodes in his neighborhood, for example, T2 have a better channel. So when T2 is transmitting, now opportunistically T2 can also transmit the FEC associated with X1. So this is a way to have collaboration uh, towards reliability within a neighborhood uh, of, of, of this. And, and again, the, the assumption here is that the overheating is possible because we the, the scenario is for sensing. And so we have a, a, a high density of, of sensors. So, so to summarize, we take advantage of the shared wireless medium, a transmitting node uh, with, uh, with low quality communication links, piggybacks implicitly on its neighbors when protecting its data. So our solution dynamically finds the optimal trade-off among these objectives, I network reliability and throughput by allocating appropriate sh uh, share of system resources to different nodes, latency problem alleviation caused by the conventional air Q uh, retransmission strategy, simultaneous transmissions on the available bandwidth via E3 and locally generated CDMA chaotic codes, and low energy consumption via efficient output power allocation. Um, so, uh, but, but, um, but for internal things, it's also important to be not only reliable, but to be persistent, right? Um, so a dense deployment of sensor is needed to continuously monitor the physical uh, phenomenon. Um, if we want, um, uh, if, 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 uh, if, if we want, so our lab has worked on the idea of, of, uh, of, of developing sensors that are biodegradable. Huh? So underneath, the traditional digital sensor uh, network composed of devices that can be retrieved. We have thought of using many, many sensors, very cheap, very low power that are disposable and biodegradable. This is achieved using electronics that, not, that is not based on silicon. And for example, uh, corn-based electronics, it's biodegradable. The problem with these uh, types of uh, electronics and components is that they cannot. They 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 can only handle very low power. So in terms of microwatts, not, not even milliwatts, but microwatts, right? Um, the, on the other hand, when you have a dense uh, network of, of 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 sensors, the practical observation is that sensor measurements are highly correlated in space and time, and this is something that can be that can be leveraged. And we propose a reliable coding communication technique. Uh, to to consider uh, to 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 to, lab, to exploit this this correlation in space and time. This is the the figure that I was I mean uh, uh, the novel sensing architecture that I was talking to you about uh, uh, for real time persistent underwater monitoring. So the on top we have the traditional wireless sensor network composed of digital nodes um, underneath. So these are the uh, the, the the buoys. But we can also have sensors that have that, 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 that the traditional digital sensing nodes. Um, and then underneath, we add what is what we call the uh, analog biodegradable substrate of sensors that are not, are not to be retrieved. They just, for example, they're 
they are they drift on, in a river and they are biodegradable and they can only be used for for the for the for the for the certain amount of time hours or days and then they biodegrade um they need to to use very very low power so we have developed a, an analog joint search channel coding um, technique based on the channel mapping uh that is based on a, a fet uh trans transistors field effect transistors uh, for encoding so the key idea that i don't have time to, to describe all the details uh, the, the, the many papers from my lab on, on on this topic but the main idea is that uh we we need to be very power efficient we said that right microwatts uh it's the power that we can handle this at the sensors otherwise because they're using these biodegradable electronics they would uh, deteriorate and they would not work so what we do uh is instead of transmitting for example, here we have two measurements, right? For each sensor we measure, for example, temperatures and it could be anything, right? Instead of, so the key idea is to, is to do everything in the analog domain, okay? Transmission, coding, uh, and sensing, it's all done in the analog domain. 70% uh, of the energy in, in, a, in, a, in a digital sensor node is, is consumed by analog digital converters, right? So we, we want to get rid of a, a ADCs, and do everything in the analog domain instead of transmitting uh, temperature and sanity, two pieces of, 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 of measurements, right? Two measurements, right? What this uh, uh, analog biodegradable sensors do is to project uh, this, uh, this sensing source point X, right? Which is the coordinates of VS and VT. We project this onto the analog joint source ch channel coding map point in green. And then what we transmit is this, the, the, this one piece of information, not two in this uh, example, right? The bold line is, is what we transmit. So the pattern is known at the transmitter and at the receiver. The receiver receives one piece of information, not two, and, and, and basically can reconstruct VT and VS with some small errors on, on the VT measurements, okay? And, and we have realized the analog circuit uh, um, in, in, in the lab, and we have shown feasibility of, of, of this idea. Um, so this is the, the part on the analog biodegradable uh, substrate. Uh, uh, we also said that um, there are many of such sensors, and then we have uh, buoys or, or uh, base stations or cluster heads that collect the data. Because of the correlation in time and space from, from the environment, there is still co correlation of data at these buoys. We have imag imagined to have a fusion center or a drone that is flying and is intermittently using some delay tolerant uh, communication interacting with this with these buoys. And then we had a, a design, and I don't have time to, to, ex uh, to explain all the details of the protocol, some solutions, some specific solutions that allow uh, the, the transmission of, of data from this uh, digital surface buoys, buoys to the fusion center to the drone to be very efficient considering the fact that some of the data is still correlated in time and space data across these buoys because the time and space correlation came from the environment right from this high density so we have proposed different protocols to take care of this correlation uh, and we have proposed a correlate what we call correlation of where hybrid RQ to avoid uh, retransmitting to the drones data that may have been corrupted during the transmissions, but is anyway correlated with maybe other packets, other data uh, that uh, has reached the drone from other base stations, right? And and this make all this solution makes makes use of 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 of, of different uh, of 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 different uh, of, of different techniques, right? Uh, for the sake of time, I think I can skip this part. Uh, the important thing is, is, is what I just said here, right? So it all starts from the temporal and spatial correlation from the phenomenon. And then we, we have developed solutions to basically take advantage of this and, uh, and, and ensure persistency in the sensing, thanks to the analog by the variable solution, but also reliability in the data that reaches the fusion center. At the end, the fusion center needs to be able to recon reconstruct in time and space the, the, the different manifestations of, of, of a specific phenomenon that we want to monitor. 
and and uh, and yeah, the, the entire idea is that the data that the reaching the the drones are not e exactly equal, right? Because of the correlation, so there is some uncertainty related to the amount of correlation that we want to 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 accept, right? Basically, so if we if we if we accept a, a low level of, of correlation, then the, the lower the level of correlation that we accept, the more efficient this this technique is on top. Uh, with respect to traditional everyday IQ. Um, and these are some, some, some results uh, where here we have the, the, the uh, here we have the, the four, four different uh, regions. Uh, so digital nodes, buoys are, are, ran, are randomly uh, deployed on the water surface and the drones here, this is the, the, the blue star is a drone that passes by each region shown by Roman numbers, one, two, three, four. To fuse the data on the right, we just have the zoom in, the magnified view of region two, this region here, uh, with different degrees of correlation. And here we have results on A on the left, the mean communication error per traffic for buoys inside one region in both low and high multipath, uh, while three different spreading length for the chaotic code are considered. And again, with the spreading length, there are pros and cons in terms of reliability, but also the use of, of, of uh, the efficient use of resources. B is the reconstruction error per, uh, per traffic for buoys inside the region while considering two different fading channels. And C, we have the long-term throughput of, co of correlated arbitrary Q for different number of data transmission buoys. And uh, more results are here. Oh, I see that. Okay, so I have here some questions and I may be able to, uh, this is a question from Professor Akil. It's the first question is, uh, is for multimedia, uh, you need higher data capabilities of, of device. What is the data rate you can achieve with your solutions experiments and the data rates to obtain high quality data? Uh, so this is for the, this is for multimedia, for multimedia, right? So our goal for our application, which is bridge inspections uh, is, uh, we are targeting, um, uh, I would say, not uh, high quality video. I will show some 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 videos here, and we are talking about hundreds of kilobits up to one megabit per second. So we are still talking about not very high quality. This is a this is a step to go from some from scalar to 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 some video, um, uh, but um, the, yeah. So this is hundreds to to. Uh, what hundreds of kilobits, what me one megabit per second. So it's pretty. That's why we need to use SVC to play with the resolution, to play with the size of the uh, of the of the um, uh, of the video and the um, and the um, um, and and the and, and the um, and the frame rate. Right? For terrestrial sensor devices, researchers use develop distributed source coding on the app layer for multimedia traffic. Did you try them for underwater cases also? Uh, those techniques can be used uh, at the application layer. So we have not tried them, but they can be used. It, th those are additional tools. So we are not competing with those. This what we're doing. It's it's lower level. And um, oh, on the video, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned the SVC, which as an extension of H two sixty four and PEG four. It offers the required flexibility by encoding chunks of video. It creates um, a base layer. And then if the quality of the channel is good, we have multiple enhance, enhancement layers, as we see here, right? Um, the enhancement layers work uh, in the temporal domain, in the spatial domain, and in the quality domain. Temporal by playing with the frame rate, spatial by, play, by playing with the size of the frame, and the quality by playing with the SNR per pixel, basically. So the challenge is more than one vehicle are often needed due to limited field of view and the visual depth of cameras in the water. And also if you want to do some 3D reconstruction. So in this work, uh, we develop a framework for underwater imagery analysis using partial information collected by various vehicles around the scene. For example, for feature matching and 3D reconstruction. So different uh, uh, robots un uh, 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 move around an object, each one takes uh, images 
uh, of videos, but then we want to reconstruct and to re re do a 3D reconstruction of the, uh, of the object. Now, to do, in order to do 3D reconstruction, these robots need to have the data from the other robots, right? Because we, you need uh, they, uh, videos from different vantage points, from different angles. So we have developed an optimized solution to provide the maximum quality of service and quality of experience for the scene reconstruction. Um, and we did uh, uh, simulations and also experiments on, a, on, a, on, a, on our testbed. And, and, uh, and I'll show uh, uh, results uh, now. So the video from different angles should be merged at uh, one of the vehicle. And then the map of region of interest should be, should be then reconstructed here. I don't know if you see, it's an example of, of different video transmissions uh, uh, playing with the different layers. Huh? So uh, it's, if you see that the, the frames are, are jumping, that's, that's, that's normal. And this is uh, what, how, how it's happening. So you, you see that at the end, the data rate changes pretty much if you, if you use basic layers or enhancement layers, right? Layer zero, you, you, it's, a, it's a 64 by 368. We, we use 1.8 frames per second. Overall, we, get, we transmit 51 kilobit per second. And, and then the other layers increase uh, either the, the in, in time with the, the frame per seconds or uh, or the um, or the, or the or in space so the, the size of the frame we also play with the SNR per pixel in SBC and and the idea is to be adaptive right and you see these are the data rates that we are talking about 50 hundreds and uh, and uh, or, or, or up to 1000 kilobit per, per sec these are to, uh, so the, the, the assumption is that while we are, uh, um, these are mostly frames where not much, uh, the, the target is, is not moving or anyway, the, te the temporal um, characteristics of the target is, is, can be captured. It doesn't, uh, doesn't change much, right? So we can play with the, with the frame rate uh, um, as, as needed, right, as, as we can. Um, so what we did here is vehicles V1 and V3, these are the three vehicles around the target, share their encoded video, which is the base layer, right? So the assumption is that the base layer can be transmitted, right? And with other nodes, with other vehicles, the enhancement layers uh, that at the receiver are combined with the other, with the base layer and all the layers increase the quality of the video, are shared with the vehicles with a better acoustic channel quality. Uh, and, and those with low, uh, lower quality channels are shut down so that they, they make room uh, for, for those with better channel. And after reaching consensus, reconstruction is performed on the highest rank vehicle after it receives a high quality video with high quality of service from the other eligible nodes. So there's consensus on for, uh, for which vehicle should do the 3D reconstruction based on many metrics of obviously the point of the data that it has, but also the energy available. Right? And if the quality of service is not satisfactory, the process is, is then restarted using a feedback uh, command. So I will, I will skip this, this part um, and I will, I will focus on this. So, uh, so basically, uh, again, even here, there are, there are trade-offs because um, you, you could think that the more data, the better, but actually what we're seeing is that it's better to have few uh, streams of few vehicles with decent quality rather than merging uh, all, all the data. So the, in this optimization, we, we try to shut down vehicles that, that uh, are, are not able to transmit enough, um, um, enough uh, layers because uh, in, in that window of time, their, their acoustic channel is, uh, is, is, is low quality. So here we have in the AC, we have the frames from the original videos. DF, we have frames of video received reconstructing in a vehicle with a, with a good channel. GI here, the, the top, the bottom three figures is that the frames of video received reconstructed at a vehicle with an average to low channel quality. Here we have the base layer transmitted and the base layer received. You see that the base layers uh, can because they uh, they are transmitted at a pretty low data rate, they can be received. So this is an example of the transmitted H two sixty four bit stream, and on the left and on the right we have the receiver H two sixty four bit stream. This is a, this is a, 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 at the bottom of the, in this table we see 
that depending on the layers, we can play with a resolution of fra frame rate and bit rate. So what the, 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 the great thing of SVC is that in, it incrementally, depending on how many layers you receive, you, you, can, you can integrate them, right? So, uh, so real time to increase, um, to increase the quality of the video. Yeah, Dario, um, yeah, I just uh, remind yes. you that we are a little bit out of time. It's uh, essentially, it's very, very interesting presentation, but maybe if uh, you want uh, to... Uh, <laughs> uh, I will wrap up in, th in three exactly, minutes. Exactly, few minutes, and, uh, exactly, yeah. Yes, so um, this, this technique has been shown to be effective in allowing then on top other applications like 3D map reconstruction, as I said, and feature match, uh, matching in, 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 in different vehicles. So, um, um, and, and, and of course, as we did that, we, we noticed problems in, uh, with the lighting, the scattering, the turbidity, uh, all, all problems that, uh, that underwater are very, very much exacerbated uh, because of, 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 well, for example, the turbidity is a big problem, right? Um, uh, and that all these problems can be uh, overcome, uh, but, 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 the, but they, they require onboard image enhancements. Um, so uh, I, will, I will stop here. I, want, I just want to say, to say that um, uh, for all the things that I said, there is a need to, uh, to, 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 to deal with softer defined um, uh, test beds and softer defined um, configurations, right? Where basically uh, you, you need to be able to adapt to the channel. Uh, there, there is still a gap, a huge gap between the models that you can use to estimate the channel. So the models are there and they are good. The problem is that they need to be fed with lots of information, temperature, salinity, uh, and, and that information that you have, I mean, provided that you know where the vehicles are, but salinity and temperature, often you don't know uh, those measurements. In fact, always you don't know. And for some applications, that's the very reason why you send the vehicles in the first place to do adaptive sampling and collect that information. So the models that would help you estimate the channel are require data that you don't have. So there is still a gap between results that you um, uh, see through simulations using these models because the, the boundary conditions are, are kind of endless, right? And, and ex results that you see from, from experiments. So basically to, to we, we have this um, um, test bed uh, that uses uh, software defined modems uh, to, uh, uh, the goal is to be adaptive, right? To do, to, to have adaptive solutions, to close the loop real time uh, in situ and, and, uh, and depending on, on how things go, right? Um, so, so yeah, I, I will stop here. So that we have lots of results on, on this test bed and they all show that uh, the only way to be robust, it's not much to rely on models, but rather to, to rely on measurements, in-field measurements, and, and then adapt uh, using SVC or techniques, all different layers to the conditions of the channel, conditions that changes, uh, conditions that change in time and and, sp and space. So yeah, I, I would uh, I would stop here just to conclude. So we press, and I pointed to the different papers for details. You can I, I refer the, the audience to these papers. We presented uh, different pieces of work and acoustic vector sensors based physical layer solution that we call signal space frequency beamforming. Then we, we uh, for link-to-link, uh, -link, uh, I mean, point-to-point -point, uh, physical layer link uh, optimization, then we proposed a probabilistic medium access control uh, solution based on space division multiple access for sparse uh, underwater networks. Then we talk about the collaborative strategy for a CDMA based underwater hybrid area queue that makes the most over overheating to minimize the retransmissions of FECs. Then we talk about the multipoint correlation where every day Q that leverages the redundancy in the spatial and temporal correlations of measuring phenomena in, in the context of persistence and reliable um, sensing of, of an environment using those uh, biodegradable uh, analog sensors underneath the traditional digital uh, sensor network. Then we talk about a protocol for underwater imagery analysis using scalable uh, coded video for multicasting and in-network to allow in-network coordination. 
And then finally, uh, uh, briefly uh, presented the MIMO based framework for our uh, experiments on, on scalable video coding. And uh, I would say I, I will stop here. I, um, uh, this, uh, I imagine that in the, in the coming decade, more and more, the, uh, we'll see an integration between communication techniques and the use of these communication techniques underwater to uh, enable distributed robotics um, and, and uh, uh, enable in-network coordination of, of, of vehicles uh, engaged in, in missions or, or coordination of sub-teams engaged in missions. So yeah, let me stop here. Thank you all. Uh, and sorry for uh, having taken a little bit longer than the one hour that I was targeting to. Uh, I acknowledge NSF and, 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 and Rutgers and my department for all the funding in the, in the, past, uh, in the past years on this, on this, uh, on this research. Um, and now I will, I will be able, so I've, I've been monitoring the charts. I think I've, I've addressed a couple of questions, but, uh, but, um, but I'm open now to, 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 to questions. Uh, either, uh, I guess, people can unmute themselves or, or I will, I'm monitoring the chat, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Dario. It was extremely interesting with so many concepts that we can explore much more. I think a lot of people also is very interested from the audience because I know most of them. Um, yeah, so there is a, um, uh, definitely there is a lot of space also for collaborations. Uh, many of these topics matches also our interest essentially. So it was an extremely interesting presentation. Um, uh, so um, I see already a first uh, question, uh, actually it's more a request. If you could uh, share uh, your uh, presentation and uh, there is also the email address um, okay, of this person that maybe we can copy somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I can it? copy uh, on yeah. email, yeah. Yeah, Definitely. so Julia, is it something that you, you, you are, so are, are you planning to, uh, so is it something that, so the, do you have the recording or do I have the recording? Uh, no, um, the recording will be available on a YouTube channel in a few days. Okay. So um, for this, essentially, we don't have yes, any problem. Very good. Exactly. Um, so, okay. Yeah, for um, Faradin, so essentially in this moment, I have troubles to copy your email address, but you can write to me right? And uh, I will ask the presentation. I will send you the YouTube link also. Okay. <laughs> we can do it in this way. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other question uh, from uh, the audience? I was very curious also about uh, the encoding and the coding technique that you use. Uh, uh, do you have some specific uh, technique like uh, convolutional neural networks or other kind of uh, uh, techniques. Yeah, I can say a little bit more about this. If you, if you want, I can say. So first of all, my presentation has been a little bit high level, and then I pointed to, to papers for details. I refer the audience to the papers for the details. In terms of the coding technique, let me clarify. So that's a coding technique that was the, um, proposed by Shannon uh, in the digital domain, okay? So the joint source channel coding uh, technique was proposed in, uh, in, in, 40, in 1947 by, by Shannon in one of his seminal papers, right? So our contribution was to uh, use it in the, in the analog world for these analog biodegradable sensors uh, that are great, but they only handle microwatts level of power. Yeah. So, so the idea was to get rid of the, the, the digital part entirely, right? And, and, and to get rid of any processing that is done in the digital part at, 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 the, low, at the lowest layer, right? Of, 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 of these analog sensors and to just allow them to do compression and transmission all in the analog domain. And, uh, and I have uh, several papers on this, this technique. We have had several designs for this analog joint source channel coding. And the last mm -hmm. design has, has been shown to use only 70 microwatts, 70 microwatts. And this is, uh, this is, this is uh, com compre it's compressing uh, in, in the example that I show using the rectangular mapping uh, two to one from two pieces of information, you basically transmit only one, but we have other, a journal paper that does 
it, um, an n to one compression when n can be three, four, five. Okay, and this is very effective when you have very limited bandwidth, and and when the the, the temporal co uh, correlation of the phenomenon is, is high. If the phenomenon is not, not changing much in time, you can compress it a lot because you can you can then um, reconstruct at the receiver. And um, and we did an analog implementation of analog joint channel coding. And the other thing that we did, the latest design, that the reason why it's so efficient is because we only use one uh, FAT uh, to, to do the mapping at the mm -hmm. transmitter uh, by using some, so the, the, the mapping that I show is for simplicity is the rectangular mapping proposed by Shannon. But if mm -hmm. you use the FED uh, um, um, current voltage curve, the characteristic curve of the transistor, you can use that characteristic curve as the map, as the map. And, oh. uh, and so basically you can use FET to, to do the projections that I was talking about in the transmission and getting rid entirely of the need of, trans of, 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 using, of, uh, of, of using any digital component. All is done in the analog component, in the analog world, and by doing that, we can save 70% of the energy because we don't use ADCs, basically. 